Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook Network. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like. Come and join us in the chat. Interactive here on a Thursday. We'll be opening up the big old bag of mail where you go give us a five-star review and you put your question in the review, throw it in the big old bag of mail, tackle it, in a future mailbag episode, uh, lots of fun ones to get to, including some leftovers from a loaded mailbag last week. We always love the early bird chat questions. Those of you who jump in before the show, join the stream, get things rocking and rolling. So uh, let's start with a question from Alex May. Alex asks, how would the NFL draft look if NFL teams could draft players once they graduate high school and allow them to play college football under their contract and be called up when they are ready. Now, except for the last part, it sounds baseball, but yeah, well, doesn't hockey do that? Yeah. Hockey does a similar version. And yeah. they still draft last night. Soccer do that or no? Soccer doesn't do that. Like internationally. There's no draft like soccer. You basically sign the kid when he's, three <laughs> right. and then you send them to your academy as as and they, basically, diapers. <laughs> they literally go to soccer school like it's an academy where they learn how to play soccer and oh and learn how to read that helps a little bit i guess so what would it what would it look like um like where would dylan rayola be drafted or where would bryce young have been drafted like the number one quarterbacks my, my starting point is the conversation that we have often about if you were allowed to draft right out of high school, there would not be a lot of players that are drafted right out of high school. It's just not mm -hmm. worth the risk. In the game of football, you would rather have fully, like there is a free development system that's like there for you. And so let them go through that development system before you're going to invest any kind of capital. And even though you wouldn't be paying them as an NFL team, you would at least have used that draft pick on someone that's super young and not necessarily proven. So I, I'm back to like the, all right, Clowney, Leonard Fournette, like a couple of uh, quarterbacks. But for the most part, you you just you wouldn't see it happen all that often. But I think the calculus changes with the question, though, because if you can draft the guy and then send him to school for three years, like right, you take that I, risk. You start seeing high school guys get drafted. I don't know if you'd see anything outside of like quarterbacks and edge rushers and high end kind of position guys going. Like I don't know if you'd be drafting a seventeen year old linebacker, but like unless he was really good. But I, I think you would see guys drafted. The only question is how early would you see them drafted? So, mm -hmm. but also maybe some of the guys in college that are typically being drafted are no longer eligible to be drafted because they're already the property or the, you know, like the player for the Carolina oh. Panthers who just spent the last three years playing at Clemson. So it would look a lot different. It That's would, it really different. would. And it would, the it would probably also be less, less viewed on television. It would be a worse television product because most of the people watching would have absolutely no idea who any of these players are. Hmm. Like I mean, a, it would be like the NBA draft then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Which, so, or the NHL draft, like last night. Like I watched the Blackhawks make the first pick, the guy that's going to save the franchise. And then after that, I had no idea who any of those guys were, and I didn't care. Whatever. Right. I was like, whatever. Okay, I could turn this off. And that's, yeah. yeah. The joy of being a Carolina Hurricanes fan is uh, you don't really have any needs. So whoever got picked at 30, you know, we're just going to send them to uh, send them to the minors and just you let them play. somebody who can put up. a puck past Sergei Bobrovsky is what you need. <laughs> Cold-blooded. Cold-blooded. Uh, all right. So on Saturday, this Saturday, that's July 1st. Happy July. It is also the day that we have all of the big realignment. Now, Danny, I remember that you suggested that we have a big catch up on all the moves that are going to be made, and then you missed the show. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a fantastic content Sweet. idea. <laughs> but um, we have, you know, new arrivals in the Big 12. It's Cincinnati, it's Houston, it's UCF, it's BYU. We've got new arrivals in the American Athletic Conference. We've got new arrivals in Conference USA. So in light of this big movement that's happening, I wanted to ask, who is the one newcomer in each conference that you are most confident in having a strong debut? And I think that that is kind of, you know, up to you to make the argument when you make your pick. Let's start in the Big 12. 
which of those four do you think have the best chance to have a strong 2023 season? Out the gate, I would go with UCF. Because I just I have fewer questions about them making the transition, especially, you know, I think, let's see, they've got Reese Plumley back. Cincinnati's going to have a new QB. Houston's going to have a new QB. BYU is playing in a conference for the first time ever. So it's, I just feel like Reese Plumley steps in, and while he is certainly a type, like he's not somebody you're going to want dropping back to throw 35 times a game, he's going to be playing Gus's putt-putt offense, doing the putt-putt. But I think, like, statistically and fit for the offense, you could look at Reese Plumley right away and say that's a top-half QB in the league. Like, ah. so, like, for because of that, I give UCF the edge of among those four. They seem to fit in, I think, with the Big 12. Like, I think they'll put up points. I think they'll probably give up a lot of points, but I think they could fit in pretty well. I think that's the easy answer. Uh, I don't – because, I mean, I – and I – I don't feel great about it. Like, I don't think they're a dark horse. Like we did the dark horse segment yesterday for the big 12. I think it's going to be a little bit of a rude awakening for these four teams that are going in. The win totals would suggest the same. I do think John Rice Pumley is a, a, a perfect quarterback for his system, but he still struggles throwing the football. I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of like the Nick Marshall at Auburn style of play, but he's not as electric. He's more powerful as a runner, but he's a really good runner. Um, but he really needs to come a little bit further as a passer if they were going to be like a dangerous threat. But I think they probably have the more most talent. I think Cincinnati's going to have some issues. I think Luke Fickle got out just the right time. BYU maybe would be, I'd say, the second option. Houston, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't feel great about Houston. Like, I feel like BYU can get to a bowl game, right? Like, if we're going by most likely to reach a bowl, I would probably go UCF, BYU, and then. Uh, Houston and Cincinnati are probably the same. Like I, I, I think I don't think anybody's going to be terrible, but I do think it's going to be much more of a it's going to be a much more difficult path than I think they've had in the last few years. You had um, top half of the Big Twelve. You could twist logic to go maybe even higher than that. So let's play an yeah. exercise like Quinn Ewers over Plumley, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Dylan Gabriel over Plumley. When he's yes. on the field, yes. <laughs> um, uh, Will Howard, Kansas State. Yes. Yeah. So there's I mean, three. I'm still kind of in shock at how much better Will Howard got last year. Yeah. He's very, I very think you good. might even take Chandler Morris over him and not haven't seen him play that much. Yeah. No, I would definitely do that. Blake Shapin. <sighs> this is I where things start probably. getting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. where it gets interesting. Um, but I'm trying to figure out, like, am I am I doing that rating based on my expectations for shape and not, you know, him not meeting them, or am I just doing that in a vacuum kind of neutral way? But I, yeah, I think you can go plumbly ahead of shape and Tyler Shuck. I think Shuck. I think that offense. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like overall the Texas Tech uh, offensive experience. Jalen Daniels probably over plumbly. Probably, yeah. but I think it's a close comp. They're yeah. very similar, I think. Yeah. It, it, you were talking about uh, of the four quarterbacks, certainly. Uh, I think that Plumlee is the best one. All right. Let's go to the American Athletic like, Conference. Can I, address, can I address the chat? Yeah, open? please. Because there's an elephant in the room that is on Chip's body. We, Chip, <laughs> Chip is, Chip got left hang, hanging to dry by Danny and I. Um, Pat McAfee included a clip from Cover Three on his show yesterday. And as a joke, I said to thank him for it, we should all go sleeveless for tomorrow's show. And Chip was the only one who actually remembered that, and he yeah. showed up without sleeves. So, well, not not fair. I am on the road. I don't travel with the, with a black uh, tank top. You can in be my topless. Repertoire. You don't have to wear a shirt. Nobody made you put one on. <laughs> well, no, McAfee. I haven't seen him go topless. He's yeah, usually well, wearing the tank. We're taking it to the next level now. That is true. Yeah, I'm missing the is, gold chain though. I'm, I'm, you're missing and a savage tan. Yeah, shout out to uh, shout out to my YMCA adult rec league basketball team. That's sort of my tank top of choice. Um, but yeah, I, Tom says let's all go uh, sleeveless. I immediately say I'm in. Danny, to be fair, you did not confirm that you were in. So was, <laughs> when Tom showed up with sleeves, I was like, oh man. I rolled them up, but we went with this tri box, and you can't see it anyway. So that's right. Yeah. 
it's okay. It's it's uh it's helping keep my my nice little like farmer's tan, like straw like a Johnson County strawberry farmer, you know, keep, keep them <laughs> in the sides. All right, so uh, the American Athletic Conference got just a whole bag of teams uh from Conference USA. So they will be welcoming uh Charlotte. They will be welcoming FAU. They will be welcoming North Texas. They will be welcoming Rice. They will be welcoming UAB and UTSA hotter than fish grease. So of the newcomers in the AAC, who do you think has the best chance to have a strong debut? I I feel like the obvious answer is UTSA based on the success it's had in Conference USA, but then it's lost to Kari Franklin. And it's like, okay, well, how big of an impact is that going to have on that offense? So I'm still going UTSA, but I really have no level of confidence in it. I'm going FAU. That's yeah, that's not a bad call. I I think that this is uh this is one of those points where the team might have been a little bit better than the record. We just didn't have the the right guy on the sideline. And they've got a ton back and you know, a few portal additions. Tom Herman now at the helm. I think that FAU has got like he walks into a group with experience and a group that with experience playing together. And this is, you know, not to go cheesy with it, but if he gets buy-in, then yeah, I think FAU could hit the ground running. And I think that that's a, that's a candidate to be not winning the American Athletic Conference. That's not my expectation. But if we want to talk about a strong debut, especially out of this six-pack of teams from CUSA, I think FAU's in a, a good – they got the right guy in charge. They got a lot of people, a lot of players back. Um, I like that. I think I'll go Owls as my pick. I like the Owls too. I think Tom Harmon took that job for a reason. I think he knows what it could be. I think he's a really good football coach who knows how to get the most out of a roster like that. Uh, Frank Harris is back, even without Zakari mm -hmm. Franklin. Like he's still, I mean, what is he, 30 years old now? I mean, he's played a lot of football. I think he's in his seventh year. Like, not, not joking. <laughs> he's played a lot of football. Jeff Trailer's another one, very, you know, highly motivational coach who's in for the long haul uh, there in San Antonio. I think they're the obvious choice, but I think it's one of those two without question. You think, you think Frank Harris's teammates call him Mr. Harris at this point? Probably. They probably call him dad. <laughs> like pop, something like that. And there's some jokes that are going around on there. Um, yeah. Yeah, unk, yeah, yeah. Unk is more likely. Yeah. I would say another, another thing in UTSA's favor, and this is the one thing that is always stood out. Like they have very, they have a large offensive line. And I think anytime you're stepping up from a conference to a, a little bit of higher level, that does help. Like if I don't, I don't know FAU's offensive line measurements off the top of my head, but if they're a little light and a little small, they might get pushed around a little bit for a year. All right. So uh, I can tell you, we are looking at uh six, four, two, 97, six, four, three, 20, six, two, three, hundred, six, eight, three, 15. Ooh. Shout out to Chaz Neal, senior tackle for the owls let's go find him six eight three he All just right. stands there that's his job you don't even have to just stand there and delay him for a second um all right and now to conference usa uh conference usa which just lost a boatload of teams is welcoming in rich rod jacksonville state liberty which just which just handed its program over to jamie chadwell that also new mexico state sam houston and yep that's it for this year, they get Kennesaw State next year, um, who apparent who will be grandfathered in and not have to pay uh, the mm -hmm. new fee. Did y'all see that? Mm -hmm. it, it used to cost just like fifteen thousand dollars or something to move from FCS to FBS, and they're moving it to one point five mil. I just can't believe it was that low. Like, could Cover Three have gone from a podcast to the FBS for just fifteen k? I think we could <laughs> we could have raised that in meat sales or we something. We could have gotten like a sponsor for that. Yeah. yeah. Let's go. <laughs> uh, all right, so if for the the new CUSA in 2023, who are we lining up with? Liberty. Liberty. Yeah, it's, I think yeah. Jamie Chadwell is going to do really well. I think they've had pretty good squads. I think he gets a pretty good roster. I think his name brand is able to bring in some transfer there as well. Uh, there as well. I like a system. I, I think it's a good fit all around. I will say, like Liberty is the obvious answer here. They're good at probably they might be the best team in the conference right away. But all those teams, I think, can have success right away in this league. Like New Mexico yeah. State with Jerry Kill was 
bowl team last year. It was solid. Jacksonville State is better, is a good FCS team. Sam Houston is a good FCS team. And you just look at, the, like we mentioned, all the teams that left Conference USA. It's not like a situation where they're joining the Big 12. They are joining a league that's probably alongside the MAC, the weakest league in the FBS. They can make some noise in there right away. Mm, very, very good point. Cusa's Cusa is going to be one of the most fun leagues. And don't forget, we got midweek Cusa in October this year. Mm -hmm. They're mm. taking over Tuesdays and Wednesdays in October. Maction comes for Tuesdays and Wednesdays in November. So midweek locks starting in October. Is that, is that CBS? We are in yep. on it. I, there's, nice. a, I think, another partner. But, yeah, CBS will be having uh, some midweek CUSA. We're very, very excited about it. I'll be it. watching it. Yeah. Coming up on the other side, jumping into the big old bag of mail, including <laughs> what outcome would be the best story of the 2023 season. That and more next. You gotta start the engine sometime soon, Erica. <laughs> of all of us being here at this time it's improbable and yet here we are together hold on to your saddles back here on the cover three podcast jumping into the big old bag of mail again leave us a five-star review and in that review you put your question we'll tackle it in a future mailbag episode this is from butterfly 955 she's got a she's got a call back to last week's mailbag episode where again i ladies i have believed for a long time that we do have a very strong female listenership but butterfly 955 starts her question with uh it's your other female listener here <laughs> Listen, I know y'all are out there. Keep filling up the mailbag. We'll keep taking those questions. Uh, I absolutely love the podcast and never miss an episode. As a Michigan fan, I think it would be incredible to see J.J. McCarthy and Cade McNamara face off for the Big Ten Championship. What other potential stories or matchups are you excited for in 2023? Maybe LSU and Notre Dame in a bowl game. Would love your thoughts. I mean, that scenario she poses is not completely out of line no like, <laughs> Iowa could very well win the west and Michigan could very well win the east um Oklahoma USC yeah in the playoffs or meet yep. New yeah. Year's six bowl something like that I mean, the, the no, all... no, no, no. better is if it's a bad bowl <laughs> yes, <that's true. laughs> I need, I need like a USC. holiday bowl kind of yes. deal <laughs> yes I need USC and Oklahoma in a bowl game that they're both disappointed to be in <laughs> <laughs> who can get their players up for the coaches that the players probably don't care about that they left the problem Miller with that, Moss out there because Caleb Williams has opted out <laughs> yeah. but see that's the problem with that because then the loser can just be like well we didn't care anyway it's like it needs to be a big game because that way the loser can't you know oh what? that's that's a great one uh I would say all right this might be biased I'll throw a few schools in there I'd love to see Texas, Florida State, Miami, one of the schools that have been struggling for the last decade, that have been close to see them punch through and get to the playoff. I think yeah. that'd be good for college football, any one of them. I think Florida State might have one of the best chances, but I would take any one of them in there. Any other school in that mix that would be a back? Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee back. That'd be cool. Yeah, Tennessee. that'd be a great story. And if they were somehow... Would that come in a second SEC team in? Yeah, the last I would team think so. in? like yeah. it would have to. It would be a situation where I think like the most realistic scenario for Tennessee to get in would be Tennessee only loses once and that loss is to Georgia. No, the realistic scenario is there. Just don't give up sixty three points to Spencer Rattler. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like that it's almost right. happened last year. If Tennessee has a win over Bama and it's only I'm, and I know Vols, I know J Jordan. This is not what you want to hear right now, but like if. The way that things broke, when USC lost on that Friday night in the Pac-12 title game and all of a sudden Ohio State was back in, if that was Tennessee with a 14-point loss to Georgia and a win over Alabama, that could that could have been you in that four spot. Remember, USC. The playoff, the playoff this year is going to be Georgia, USC, Texas, and Florida State. I've already got, I've been on the record with this a thousand <laughs> times. Clip that. 
Yeah. USC get I think Oregon, if Oregon was that dark horse that came through, I think that'd be a good good storyline. There's not a single group of five. There's not a Cincinnati story here. And the problem is like who's the next Cincinnati? Cincinnati just went to the Big Twelve. Right. It would be kind of funny if UCF went to the Big Twelve, won the Big Twelve in year one and got to the playoff. Yes. That'd be a great story. Damn. Yeah. So something like that. Something, something along the lines of UCF getting to compete for an, a national championship, actually, in the same way that it's counted everywhere else. I would take that. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's go to the next question. This one comes from Nate. Nate says, man, y'all are truly the best. I listen to all I listen to all of your competitors because I'm a college football junkie, but you're the only ones I get excited for when y'all pop up in the feed. Yeah. Every Question. other college football podcast sucks. It's true. This is the only one you need to listen to. I mean, we're the only one that's still popping up in your feed here on June 29th. That's right. I said it before. <laughs> I will fight every other podcast out there. I don't care. Bring it on. Question based partly off presumption. We're told that modern players are superior athletes to players from generations ago, which I see as a half truth, but it could be argued that players from the past were far tougher than modern players due to rules, overall culture and new schemes. If we go with both arguments, which players from then and now could play at the highest levels in any generation, regardless of the changes over time, guys like Bo Jackson and Derrick Henry stand out, but my little old imagination goes wild thinking about Tommy Frazier passing out of a modern RPO or a guy like Caleb Williams running the wishbone. He included Derrick Henry as a player from a previous generation. <laughs> like Derrick Henry's <laughs> right. in this generation. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you dropped Derrick Henry. Anyway. Old ass Derrick Henry getting out of his wheelchair and puss strapping on the cleats one last time. Um, Don in the chat with a great one, Jim Brown, you know, like we've, Jim Brown passed recently and there was a great like moment to be able to reflect on just what an unbelievable athlete he was that I think that you could, you could drop a Jim Brown pretty much any time and he would be successful. Dion, Dion, you yeah. could put out there today and he would lock down receivers. Yeah. I, th I mean, I think that's kind of the truly great players of their era could probably, they probably, I don't think they would be. Who's a great player that wouldn't. You know, like that you think would struggle. Ooh, can I can, can I tell you what just popped into my mind? What? Tebow would have been eaten alive in 2023. Because the offense isn't as new. Yeah. yeah. Skills, I mean, it, we've seen teams with like the battering Ram qu quarterback trying to copy what Florida was doing in 2007 and 2008, and those teams are eight and four. Right. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, Tebow's a good call. I mean, would Tommy Frazier be as good today? Like he mentioned it in the question. I don't, we didn't get to see him throw it as yeah, much, so you don't really it. know. That's what I'm saying. Like, I don't know if Tommy Frazier would be as good as he was in that offense in this modern era, especially with how much quicker defensive players have become because defensive linemen and linebackers now – are running as fast as Tommy Frazier was running at the time. So I don't think he would be, I think guy, if, if your greatest asset was speed in a lot of ways, I think you would struggle because everybody has become so much quicker. So sure. like guys like Desmond Howard, who were phenomenal at the time, especially as returners, because you got him in the open field and there was just nobody that could keep up with him. Devin Hester, those guys, like, I don't know if they would be as successful. They'd still be successful and they'd still be very good players, but I don't think Desmond Howard's winning a Heisman if he's playing right now. Mm. Tennessee would figure out something. Josh Heupel would just send him deep every time. <laughs> um, all right. I like that question. Thank you, Nate. All right. This next one comes from Chris. And Chris asks, the Cover 3 podcast is simply the best podcast out there. Not just the best college football podcast, but the best podcast overall. I love you guys. It's love true. you too, Chris. Given now that Oklahoma and Texas know what their schedule will look like in 2024, and of course, remember, Oklahoma totally railroaded, right? Yeah, just the worst <laughs> thing ever. I can't, can't believe it. Uh, do you see it shaping any personnel decisions for this upcoming year? specifically pertaining to quarterbacks. 
wouldn't Brent Venables rather go into 2024 with a well-seasoned Jackson Arnold rather than making him make his first start after Dylan Gabriel when they're in the SEC? Also, wouldn't Steve Sarkeesian like to have the same with Arch Manning rather than have Quinn Ewers bolt to the NFL after this year? Just wondering, Chris in Colorado. I want to win games this year. Yeah. Especially on Brent Venables. No, yes, exactly. Seven. Yeah, uh, whoever gives you the best chance to win. And look, Danny, you've suggested like Jackson Arnold by the middle of the season and Dylan Gabriel's health up and down. Like that might not be, have anything to do with the SEC. That might have to do with what you need to do right now. A hundred percent. They need to win. They need to catch some momentum because if they have another lackluster season, it starts to impact recruiting. You get negatively recruited against the questions start to arise. Is Brent Venables going to be here? Is he on the hot seat? Like you don't want any of that. So I think for both schools, you are playing whoever gives you the best chance to win. That's just the simplest question there. I think it's easy. Yeah. That's the thing too. Like with Oklahoma, if Jackson Arnold is playing really well and Dylan Gabriel is struggling, I don't think they're going to be shy about replacing Gabriel with Jackson Arnold if he's living up to that hype. But the Texas situation is different, too, because redshirting, I believe, is part of the agreement for Arch Manning going there. I don't know that, you know, it was like we're coming in right away and we demand to be a starter. It's like I think they were very much OK with redshirting for a season and learning and then letting Quinn Ewers take that job. So I, I don't think that's really I mean, also I, got, what's his name? I Luke think Murphy. so, too. Yeah, yeah. I think so, too, until I talked to Colt McCoy at, in Phoenix at the Super Bowl. I had him on set, and he's like, man, he's like, Arch is going to challenge for the starting job. Now, then that as soon as like at the spring game comes out, Sark's like, nope, <laughs> it's like <laughs> Quinn's our guy. But I think that was probably just to try to do what's best for the team. But you got to remember, too, Quinn Ewers had some injury issues last year. Yeah. You know, like, I think what will be really interesting is if – Malik Murphy comes in or is it Arch Manning? Do you just try to, and I, it probably depends on how they looked in practice, but if it's based on that, Malik Murphy looked great in the spring yeah. game. I would bet it'd be Murphy at number yeah. two. The, and a lot can happen in the off season. You know what college football coaches say, like the difference between week one and week two is huge year one, year two. And you know what Arch Manning showing up fresh faced in January, losing his student ID every other day. And then like, you know, <laughs> going through spring practice, going through off season conditioning, when he returns for fall camp, he could be much improved. But I got the sense from the practice reports and, you know, people that were much closer to the program than I am that when you're like, arch, 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 everyone's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. Mm -hmm. He's, He's still got to learn some stuff. And that's what made me think it's not the physical talents, which made him the number one overall prospect. It's literally like the mental side that he just has to get adjusted to a much higher level of competition, both in your teammates and who you're playing. And I think that, you know, they're, that led me to be like, oh, okay, Arch is third. Like I'm going to do a segment on CBS Sports HQ later today. We're guessing who's going to win the starting quarterback battles. The quit the Texas job is still on there because Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning, Arch Manning. And like that's that's the response. It's like he's actually third. And if something happens to yours, especially early in the season, I would expect it to be Murphy, not Manning, who ends up coming in. All right, let's do a question from the chat. This one coming from Sean. He got in uh, before the show. He says, mailbag question. Is there any possibility that a school like Clemson, Florida State? Miami, Oregon, Washington would end up going independent rather than stay with their conference. Probably not. I mean, are any of those schools getting the kind of television deal that they uh, would need to do that? Especially mm -hmm. because like, I, I don't know. Does the grant of rights with the ACC include going independent? Like, can you just leave? Or is that only like applicable if you're going to a different conference? No, you, whatever. Like if you, Florida State leaves and they sign you're up. Paying exit own, fees, right? Well, mm -hmm. you sign up with your own ESPN deal just for Florida State. Then oh, can you all the money, lawsuits? all the money off of that you would owe to the ACC until 2036. So even if you went off and went independent, you would still owe that money back according to the grant of rights. And that's part of it too, because like the ACC's television deal is with ESPN. So if Florida State wants to leave and get its own television deal, it can't be with ESPN. So you're taking one of the biggest bidders off the table. I, I would say if this was to happen, it would be one of those two Pac-12 schools. But even then, I really don't see it happening. 
I don't either. I thought Sean created a fantastic five since we like all the names. Like, do they break off and start their own? You know. So they call it the Power Five. Really get people confused. <laughs> if y'all that actually any... wouldn't be a bad little mini conference, though. No. <laughs> have you uh, have y'all had trouble with NIL and NLI this week? <laughs> a little bit. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the National Letter of Intent and Name, Image, and Likeness, both in the headlines this week, has it's been tough. A little bit of alphabet soup there. June. So. Until you mentioned the, you know, what kind of television deal are they going to get? I, I initially thought, sure, Florida State was independent. Penn State was independent. You know, Miami was independent. We at least have in college football history that idea. But the money side is big. And also, if schedules continue to expand, it's going to be hard to yep. put together a schedule. Like Notre Dame even has five guaranteed games against ACC opponents to help them start to you know, craft their future schedules. So I, I would say it's not likely, but you know, we'll see. Like if they're independent, it's because they're also part of like a new super league. Right. And, and also why did they give up their independence? What happened in college sports that caused them to want to join a conference? Is that the Oklahoma? Yeah. No, the television. Yeah. I was going to say the Supreme court ruling yes. of the NCAA versus Oklahoma board of mm -hmm. regents, which allowed conferences to create their own television deals. And it's why the NCAA gets not a penny off of the, uh, the television deals for college football. And it all goes straight to the conferences and maybe one day from the conferences to the players. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coming up on the other side, we continue questions from the big old bag of mail, including an interesting college football playoff suggestion and more of y'all's live audience questions. Next. They say patience is a virtue, but for some things, we can't wait. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, this next question comes from King K. Love the show, guys. Perfect for in-season, off-season, gambling, and just pure entertainment. Questions. Two questions. One. What do you think about the concept of the top seeded teams in the playoff getting to pick their matchup instead of an automatic five through 12 matchups? The five through eight seeds get to pick from the nine through 12 seeds. This could help avoid rematches, offer plenty of intrigue and drama, and give real opportunity for advantages for the higher seed. Number two, with conferences getting larger and larger, do we even need division? Do, don't we need divisions more than ever? I see why conferences are dropping divisions, but the separation is helpful when the schedules can be so unbalanced from this and would it help avoid conference title game rematches? I liked the part about should they pick their... Yes. yes. Make yes. this... Who was that? Who who suggested that? What was it's, the name? It's username on, uh, on Apple Podcasts, King K Rules. Make King K commissioner of college football if he's going to do that. because could, And in a sport where we're constantly looking for um, content... Can you imagine Kirby like have a live selection special yes. Kirby mm -hmm. smart going up to the microphone. All right. We want to play uh, UCF, you know, like, an, an, or what if he did pick the other sec team and it was like such a diss to them or whatever, it would be phenomenal. And yep, it would be sure. some really intrigue. Cause once you got past one, it could get really interesting two, three, and four. Like it, it could really provide some intrigue. I love the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. I would, I would a hundred percent want them to do that because that would make it a lot more fun and then also oh could you imagine like, <laughs> i'm just i'm thinking of the possibilities could you imagine yeah. after the game let's say they picked ucf gus malzahn would be like and they wanted us yes. and we knocked them <laughs> off like you could hear the chip on their mm -hmm. shoulder like speeches after oh it'd be phenomenal it'd be a very humbling experience for a lot of people yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. when all of a sudden mm -hmm. you get picked and what that mm -hmm. means. Wait, so, what do you mean they want to play us? What? <laughs> yeah, right. What a, what a mind. Mental Good advantage, thing. too. Um, Gosh, do they do that insane. anywhere? Like, I, I was thinking, I was trying to pull, so soccer obviously has the pots, right? You know, yeah. whether it's like the World Cup or the Champions League, you don't know the matchups until they pull all the pots out and everything gets matched up. So there is some drama, like you were saying, uh, Danny, like we always... For all the Champions League draws, there's a you know big television or you know television side, news side, fallout reaction, all that. But we don't have any. You get to pick your opponent in mm -hmm. sports, do we? I think, oh, great! No, not that I know of. Maybe in like some smaller semi-pro leagues, but not in any of the major sports. And I really wish they would. 
Uh, like in every sport, like if the NFL, like the teams that got the bye, they get to watch the wild card games and see who the winners are, and then the number one seed gets. Yeah, no, we want them. <laughs> yeah, somebody's quarterback goes down, and it's like, right. mm-hmm. yeah, right. yeah. Well, We'll take Jackson. And just the strategy in it. Like if you had a scheme, like somebody there was a hot team you didn't want to play, I think it'd be phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Also, like made for TV. Do you do like the NBA draft when you have some former great make the pick or like the coach's son or somebody like that? Like a little like if you want to ease the pain a little bit, you have like a little seven-year-old who's like, We well, want to play UCF. Yay. Like that. <laughs> you know? Um, that's I'm in. I, I like I'm it. In. I like, like it a lot. Ceremonies. All right, let's go to uh roll the... out to <laughs> toss this one. <laughs> oh, the <laughs> fake the out? Fake? Yes. yes. Oh, we need to make this happen. <laughs> uh, all right, this uh this next one comes from the chat. We got uh here we go. J E Carr 1321 got in at 9 a.m. this morning, two hours before showtime. We'll reward that, baby. He says, My mailbag question: why are there no challenges between conferences? i.e. the ACC versus the Big Ten, RIP, ACC, SEC challenge now. But uh, why are there no challenges between conferences? In, like in basketball, I'd never leave the couch if two weeks in September, the Big Ten got to beat up the SEC. <laughs> uh, I love it. I, I don't know. I mean, there's you could do it theoretically. I just don't think anybody wants to do it. Wow. I would love it. I think it'd yeah. be phenomenal. It's just, it's a little more complex in a 12 game schedule when now we're getting up to some, you know, some conference playing nine games to, to get it. Have you guys seen week two? Now it's not, uh, cause I was, I was looking at the schedule week two, especially for the big 12 and pack 12. There's almost a little mini aspect to this and none of it's official, but like you've got, uh, Utah playing Baylor. You have um, there was an Oregon playing Texas Tech. Um, Cincinnati's playing Pitt. Oh, Illinois is playing Kansas. So there's, mm-hmm. That's also Texas not, Alabama week too. Yeah, yeah. So there's the Big Twelve is taking on a lot of other conferences. I wish it was you know one versus the other, but I think it's I don't and it's just too hard to get it all lined up. I mean, shoot, we have games scheduled out till twenty thirty five or whatever. Yeah, I, I think it's more financial than anything. Because, like, with college basketball, I mean, don't the coaches kind of have far bigger of a say in the schedule from year to year? Like, yes, it, yeah, that's not how it really works in football. It's mostly the athletic department who's deciding these things a decade in advance because of the financial reasons. Like, if you're playing an FCS team, odds are you're paying them seven figures or close to seven figures to come play that game. And if you're doing this kind of matchup where you're doing it on the fly i i don't know i think it probably adds a whole lot of headaches to somebody's somebody's job and also you'd probably be killing off a lot of the smaller schools because they wouldn't get those paychecks i was gonna say it'd be a good way to uh fix the bowl system a little bit i think the i think the matchups would be made way more compelling if all of a sudden you had all right the top three make the playoff four five six you played sec versus big ten four five six finishers play there in the bowls also, you can't even convince the SEC to play another SEC team. <laughs> Try to get them to play another conference. Yeah. The um, the expansion to nine game conference schedule, I think, leads to more of what you're talking about, Danny. Because everybody's got a nine game conference schedule, so there almost becomes naturally not an agreement, but by circumstance. All right, week two, this is when everybody's going to play their Power Five non con, yeah. and it does kind of take on a, a cool aspect. Week two is a uh, locked and loaded, and on the sneak. Can I bring up one little apropos thing I saw today that I learned that just because it goes off of stuff we talk about, I just took a shot at the SEC. I was just doing research, right? And I was looking at how many games teams have played against FCS opponents in the last six years. Do you know what conference seven of the top 10 teams who have all played six? There have been 10 teams who have played six FBS opponents in the last six years. Do you know what conference seven of them belong to? It's SEC. Nope. It's the ACC. Yep. Yeah. Ooh. The things I make not. fun of the SEC for doing turns out the ACC does more, um, and they also stick they, to eight games, and they also lose a lot of those. And they also jumps. lose a lot of. Them. <laughs> no, no, no. They they lose to the group of five. You know when they schedule ODU at ODU, and you yeah. go into their house and go take an L. Um, I'm not going to cape up for that piece of information that you learned, but I think that if you were to comb through each of the individual, you know, FCS games, they're all in state. Like it, it is, and there's just a lot of schools, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you just have, 
Um, so like Miami's going to be playing Bethune Cookman, right? And Bethune Cookman shows up on either a Florida State or a Miami schedule regularly. That is an in-state program. Um, you know what? North Carolina A and T almost Clemson always plays. Yep. It almost always plays uh, Duke. Furman going up against Clemson. North Carolina's going to be playing Campbell. Shout out to Mike Minter, former Carolina Panther, who's the head coach down there for the Fighting Camels. So, I, it's not an explanation. Like you're you're 100 right to be able to at least like call it out. But I do understand, I guess, the politics, or at least you know why those games come to be. Well, the perception, as far as the way that people view the SEC compared to the ACC doing it, is that the ACC plays those games in September, and the SEC is doing it in November, and people feel like that's cheating. Well, yeah, because we're ramped up for college football, and yeah. now all of a sudden, the seven <laughs> most interesting teams favored by forty-five points. It's a real mm -hmm. dull ending. Also, speaking of the end of the season, we do have an, a, a a mini ACC SEC challenge. When we you have on the very same weekend, Florida, Florida State, Barbara, where we going yeah, Louisville, Kentucky, South Carolina, Clemson, Georgia, Georgia Tech. So, uh, kind of get that. SEC kind of runs that one. Shout out, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Not all of them. Not all of them. Does Vanderbilt all. play Wake that weekend too? Do they do they do that? I thought I remember Vanderbilt one rivalry does, weekend. Vanderbilt plays Wake in September this year. Oh, okay, but it's not um, every time. All right, this nerds. next question, <laughs> going back into the big old bag of, yeah, gold, black, nerds. Yep. Perfect, mm -hmm. dollar match. They get together uh, and read books. <laughs> uh, let's see, this is from Seth, and he says, uh, best college football pod out there, been listening since the 24-7 days. Question, why isn't Boise State appealing to any Power 5 conferences? It's the blue turf. <laughs> it's ugly. Nobody likes it. If Boise State had gone to the Big East before the Big East collapsed, would then Boise State have been able to make a move with West Virginia to the Big 12 or sort of you know the way that that all scrambled out? TCU was going to join the Big East at one time too. They, of course, landed in the Big 12. What? What's up with that? I think timing plays a part in it. Because, you, like, when when Boise was joining the Big East during that last line, like, of realignment, when, you know, Rutgers and Maryland were joining the Big Ten and the, it was a couple big, you know, that was all driven by cable television. Like, Mark. cable boxes mattered. And at the time, Boise didn't really have the cable boxes in the area, although the population in Idaho and Boise area has grown since then. Now in realignment, the cable boxes still matter and the markets still matter, but the brand is probably more important. And in the last few years, Boise State's brand has kind of suffered a bit as other G5 teams have kind of become the, you know, Cinderella darlings. That's no longer really Boise. So I think timing more than anything is what has kept Boise from really finding a P5 home. Shout out to Don in the chat who's put, uh, pointed out that the academics standards, academic standards have been an issue True. possibly for yep. some of the other Power 5 conferences. I'm not familiar with where they rank on the, the scale or what the issue is there, but I know the PAC 12 prides itself on, you know, trying to find academic institutions. So that makes some sense. Uh, and I wonder too, if still the market plays some role mm -hmm. in it, you know, and then travel, it's a tricky travel destination to get to, you know, it's just, it's kind of out of the way and it doesn't really regionally fit with a lot of places. The um, academics is always hilarious to me because it matters until it doesn't. Yeah. Right. You know, when, when, yeah, the, didn't we magically have a bunch of schools like upgraded? What's the, uh, the AAU? AAU? Yeah. AAU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. AAU, just, I, like the same thing that right I played AAU room. basketball. Is it the same thing? <laughs> is it different? <laughs> no, there's far less structure in the academic one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> the AAU also includes like Yale and Harvard and guys mm -hmm. who would never make AAU teams. So, you know, it's a very different. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. All Imagine right. playing sports at one of those Ivy League schools. Oh my gosh. The biggest nerd alive. <laughs> how are we how are we going to have double Barton Simmons sh shots here? And the gang <laughs> Seth even just out here said that he's been listening since way back in the day. Um, let's see. Let's go one more live question. All right, this one comes from John Townsend in the chat. He says, mailbag, I've heard many reasons why Georgia Tech won't reach a bowl this season. 
Can you provide reasons why they will? Some are giving Louisville the W in that first week, but I like Tech's chances. Anybody want to take this one? I Like why they will? Okay, mm -hmm. here. <clears throat> Brent key effect. Let's go. That's literally like the, the fact that actual scouting reports on this team are like, he coaches them up. They play hard. It's like all of the things that you can't actually quantify. All right. Haynes King at one time was a blue chip quarterback with power five SEC quarterback aspirations. And if I pulled, you know, I know I say this a lot, but I think I could put together a super cut of Haynes King highlights from the limited time that he's had in action that could make you believe. I think the other skill positions would require a lot of development and help, but you at least do have a quality quarterback after losing a quality quarterback in Jeff Sims. So I think the conversation would start with coaching them up and quarterback. The Louisville game is interesting though, because that one could be the deciding factor. I mean, I was counting through and found five ish and Louisville could potentially be the six. So, All right, so let's go game by game. You know, like Louisville win or loss. At loss. Home. It's probably well, it's a at loss, home. but that could be the one. I wonder what the point spread will be on that one. So that is in the big body bins, and it's losing a home game. They only have three true home games in conference play. So, and like Atlanta to Louisville, that's an hour and a half Delta flight. Okay? The cards are going to be riding for Jeff Brom for that start of the season. I think. Yeah, but I think you see the way Brent Key had the student body and the fan base excited, and he was going over, and they were kind of recapturing the home field advantage there that section will look fantastic the <laughs> other like thirty thousands, it's already you know what that's a disadvantage they got red seats in that building they got yeah. red seats in that building and it's just going to be filled with louisville fans prove me wrong georgia tech i look forward to it but yes i this is tom please continue this is the toughest schedule in the acc i was gonna say like the home slate louisville south carolina state bowling green bc unc syracuse and georgia like SC State, they should win. They yep. should win the Bowling Green game. They can beat Boston College at they home. Should they should win. I think they should win. I think they should beat Boston College. Yeah. And they should beat Syracuse at home. Ooh. So there's four wins. And I think they could get Virginia on the road. That was Ooh. my fifth. That's the thing. They need like two road wins. And the, the road schedule is where things get tricky because it's Ole Miss. I don't <laughs> think they're winning that. At Wake Forest. Can't rule it out. I'm just not thinking it's possible. Miami. Can't rule it out. Um, Virginia, <laughs> I would give it to them. Like, I think they could win that game if Virginia looks anything like it did last year. And then at Clemson, they're not winning that game. So they can do it. But, man, I do not like the odds. Louisville is an eight-point favorite in that first game. This yeah. Season. Louisville's a good team. Like, there was a lot of stuff just with, yeah. It's a, another example of like find find the spot where the underlying team was pretty good and now we've got a coaching change it's the new sunny dykes tcu effect that's the thing like the Satter, satterfield had to get out of there just based on the way things were going but if you looked at like some of the underlying metrics of that team last year that team was better than its record showed yeah, and I now the three Brown, podcasts made some money on louisville yes being able to be better than it actually uh appeared yeah so the only game helps too uh, we'll be very interesting to uh, to check that out. Uh, appreciate all of y'all hanging out, watching live with us, youtube.com slash covered three. We've got a bunch of summer schools heading our way. Our thanks to Bud for grinding on that and all the experts from 24-7 Sports. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Danny Canelli. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you.